I would first like to introduce uh, today uh, panelists or speakers and the moderator, uh, Mike and Marta. And I would like to say a few words about uh, both of them. Uh, starting from uh, Mike, uh, I would say that uh, he's the founder and president of the ZAP Group, a family office investing and advisory firm. The ZAP Group acquires and oversees well-run family businesses with revenues between uh, 50 and 300 uh, million. Uh, he is executive advisor to the Blackstone Group uh, since 2011, and he sits on the board of uh, Stericycle since 2020. Uh, he was on the board of directors of Boeing uh, up until recently, uh, uh, until 1st of May uh, from 2004, so that was a long time period. Uh, I would say that uh, Mike also in the past, so uh, we know Mike uh, from the past as being part of G, Motorola and Nortel. He was also uh, part of the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee and president of this committee uh, that was uh, providing recommendations to the president of the United States on the wide range of policy issues related to telecommunications, IT, cybersecurity, and other national security concerns. Uh, what I would also like to say about Mike is that he's equally accomplished and successful in his private life as in his professional life. Um, he's proud Macedonian a citizen, and we're also proud that he's a Macedonian citizen. Uh, he's a father of three sons, happily married, and also he has three grandsons uh, and granddaughters. And I hope I, I, I didn't uh, miss this part. Uh, Mike also is a great, or he was a great basketball player. He's a big Duke basketball and Manchester United uh, fan. Uh, he uh, emigrated uh, to, to the United States when he was at the age of uh, 16. Uh, he completed three uh, Ironman races. Those of you that know Ironman would know that this is a great accomplishment, including Kona 2018. And uh, as I mentioned, he, he regained Macedonian partnership just now in May 2020. I would also say that uh, Mike is one of the founders of Macedonia 2025. and really grateful for, for that. Each of us should be grateful and proud of that. And he's also uh, founder or estab he established uh, the Zafirovsky Kellogg Executive Development Program uh, in partnership with Kellogg School of Management, uh, which is a program that provides uh, scholarships and ensures professional development of middle and top uh, CEOs uh, from Macedonia. Uh, his uh, dream is that uh, the top 100 uh, CEOs from Macedonia uh, are really educated to, to this program. And indeed, part of this program is related to leadership, the title or topic that we are going to discuss uh, today. So Marta, uh, Marta, I've known Marta since my early age, and I'm happy that now we are also professionally connected with uh, Marta. Uh, Marta is owner and general manager of uh, Zavar Company. Uh, she is also alumni of the Kellogg program. This is what connects directly uh, Marta and Mike and the organization. Uh, she, she received this scholarship in uh, 2018 and her experience from the program was, was great. Uh, she's, uh, as I mentioned, managing director of Zavar Company and founder uh, of the company, but also award winning um, uh, many international really renewed uh, awards uh, for the design uh, to this company. Uh, she's also founder and uh, board member of uh, MAMEI, which is Macedonian Association for Metal and Electro Industry. And for five years, she, she was also program director of Skopje Design Week and board member of uh, uh, Netherlands uh, Chamber of uh, Commerce for four uh, years. Uh, so I'm very happy to have them both uh, in this uh, webinar, and uh, I'm really looking forward to their uh, interview uh, and discussion uh, today. Uh, I would also like to uh, mention a few housekeeping rules. I would like to ask uh, every one of you to be uh, muted uh, while there is discussion, but um, we suggest also that throughout the whole webinar today, you're muted. Uh, we also encourage you to pose your questions to the chat, uh, and at the end, I would then combine with the questions and then pose uh, to Mike. Um, so about the timing, uh, the plan is that we have 40 minutes of interview between Martha and Mike, and then we have three, 30 minutes of uh, Q&A, uh, but we are really willing, and Mike and uh, Marta are willing to extend this part uh, with additional 15 minutes if there is any interest. So we would really like to answer all, all, your, all of your questions and to hear your uh, comments. Uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded and then it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel, uh, and we will share this uh, with all the registered 
uh, participants uh, during the following uh, days. So that was all from my side. I will jump in later with the Q&A session. And now I would like to ask Marta uh, to start the interview. So Marta, the floor is yours. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar in a, in a role that um, Macedonia 2025 and uh, the, the three of us in the, in the preparation of this uh, webinar decided that uh, it won't be a, like a inspiring uh, speaking session uh, of Mike, but more like an like interview uh, and a conversation on a leadership talks. So I, um, I give the, the name of our leadership talks and uh, I hope that we will be uh, uh, we will try to cover this uh, always um, interesting sub subject especially in times like this and that we will uh, going to uh, keep your attention I would like to start with uh, one uh, with the closing remarks on the Macedonia 2025 summit in 2018 that uh, Mr. Zafirovsky uh, set on his closing ceremony speech and it goes like this make yourself the best you can be and all of a sudden you can see yourself grow the people around you your company that's becoming a force multiplier so mike do you still believe in this statement can you share a good example of how values-based leadership has changed organizations and people yeah, Marta, absolutely, positively, and I would argue more than ever. I mean, I do want to say, hopefully, it's okay for people to be inspired, even though <laughs> this is quote unquote only a QA session. But hopefully, this will be very interesting for all of you. And I do want to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I know there's people from uh, Europe, Australia, and, um, and obviously, US as well. So, but I very much believe in that statement, and I would argue more than ever. I mean, before the crisis, there was such a war on talent in most parts of the world. I mean, there was almost a record levels of unemployment, a record, um, if you will, pursuits of people with the right skills. And there is a certain level of crisis now, and obviously unemployment is reaching very, very serious uh, levels. But this too will pass. I know we'll be discussing that in a few, in few minutes. But I believe the organizations that will be successful in short term, mid term, and long term truly will take this values based approach. Uh, customers expected, employees respected, and frankly, all the universities, whether it's in Australia, Europe, uh, or the United States. Uh, one example at Kellogg, values based leadership has become the most popular course uh, in Harvard. Reimagining capitalism has become the most popular course. So all the new leadership that's coming in, a lot of the most exciting and, and the successful companies in the world actually not only say those words, they provide the right incentives to train their people, to recognize and to reward it. I know not all the countries are the same. I know we have some challenges in Macedonia, which I'll be discussing uh, in a few minutes. But this statement, I think, is as true now as ever. And this company moves from the current crisis into the next stage. Uh, this is a perfect time to reflect what you're doing personally and also what are you doing for your employees if you're a leader or general manager or uh, owner of your business. So uh, you are saying that uh, the, the, the time is coming, that's for sure, especially after the crisis for value-added uh, uh, there is bad uh, leadership, uh, but uh, do you think that there are enough in the world today, value-based leaders, or this is just the future? Uh, I do believe much more now than even 5, 10, 20 years ago, but certainly not enough. And I think that really is the opportunity. And again, I to quote again my, my friend Harry Kramer, People always expect the government or the CEO or someone from corner court above to be taking that uh, leadership uh, opportunity. And that's why I always encourage all of us to believe that we can be the change 
we want the system to be. And frankly, the, all the people from Macedonia have met, whether that's the Shuli program, the Jabito program, obviously through the Keller program. We see that raw talent in place. That's our hope for us to actually not only say those things in classrooms, but to actually start behaving in that way in our day-to-day -day activities. So how, how, is, how to become a value-based leader? What, is there a, any recipe? How does uh, it start for you? I mean, three things. One is you have to make a personal commitment to yourself. And actually, it's much easier, it's much easier than most people believe. Second, to try to be that, try to work in that sort of a company, of that your own company to, um, to um, develop it um, yourself. Number three, to network. They, you know, based on whom you're working with, other there's a chamber of commerce within your organizations, MK2025. And frankly, I mean, this is a straight man. Um, uh, Harry Kramer just published his new book, just came last Tuesday. You're 168 hours. I bought 200 of those books personally. I'll give it to many of the mentees. It really goes to a recipe of tell us what you think is important to you, including if you want to become a values-based leader, and then ask yourself, are you spending the time within the 168 hours, is obviously the number of hours in a week, are you spending your time consistent to what you say uh, that, uh, that you want to become? All sorts of books, all sorts of classes, including MK2025 can, um, can provide, but starts with a view of a can you commit yourself to be that, uh, that type of a leader? So how, how does it start it, uh, start it for you? Um, there is a searching for and preparing for this uh, webinar. I uh, find an article about uh, the period of you uh, in your career when you were uh, trying to fix Nortel. And it uh, talks about <laughs> your top six leadership principles. I will try to just uh, briefly uh, go through them. And um, <laughs> so it says, delight customers, motivate employees, and create positive work environment, ensure confidence in ability to attain career goals, deliver strong financial results, give back to communities, compete and win, and demonstrate the expected leadership values. So how did this work, uh, not only for Nortel, that, that was the, the, the reason this article was uh, signed, but for sure yeah. also in your other companies. Well, I mean, that's very interesting actually. And goes back to the previous comment to really identify what your leadership style is. And Nortel is a perfect example. Although you may do everything, you want to do, although you may want to give it all, the outcome may not be what you're hoping for. And we'll discuss leadership in crisis. Nortel certainly did not turn out the way we're hoping. But I can assure you, at the end, the management team and the employees really felt that we did everything which we thought was the right thing to do for the, for the organization. Back on those top six, I mean, the first time I deliver those leadership um, principles, if you will, was back in October 1, 1986. I was 32 years old, totally unexpected. I was asked to become a CEO of a GE business. So I had two weeks to prepare to address 400 employees. And I came up with those six principles. I think those are very much adaptable from one business to another. Uh, 300 of those employees are factory workers. So it wasn't just a type of a um, professionals on, on this call. And I said, look, I know <laughs> you look at me, you would, you would wonder uh, if, um, if um, uh, what you can expect from me. To say I have high expectations from myself. This is what you can expect from me. At the same time, I have very high expectations from you and the organization. Number one, just to quickly go, delighting customers. Not only take them to a ball game or have coffee, but we really understand what their challenges are and to go above and beyond to really address their needs. Second, and even back you know, uh, 35 years ago, I said, I'll do everything possible to help each, each and every one of you achieve your career ambitions. 
So not only are we happy with the benefits in typical employee satisfaction surveys, but to say whether you are a factory worker or an entry-level person, we have a training programs and opportunities to do everything possible to help you develop your, uh, your career. Number three, superior financial results. Lots of people may take an exception to that. I said superior financial results is a litmus test if you have a successful organization. Number four, giving back to the communities. Uh, I thought people or organizations that do well should be giving back to the communities. So anyway, anytime I went to a new organization, by the way, uh, last week was 20 years exactly when I started at Motorola. And I looked at a videotape introducing myself to 3,000 employees. And those are the same comments were made to them. So anyway, the, the comment really was, whether you have crisis or not, as a leader, you should know what your leadership style is. You should communicate that to your colleagues, to your customers, to your employees, and you should hold yourself accountable. So every time you're making a decision, reflect. <laughs> I, see, I see this in a leadership style when the challenges come and actually behaving in this way. And if you do, credibility develops and that's how you start to have developing winning companies. And I would argue most successful business leaders, uh, most successful coaches and sports teams uh, can be uh, not-for-profit organizations. They have a leadership style that they espouse, they communicate, and that's the basis for their, uh, you know, for their decision making. How do you think this fits to, to, to the modern society? Is, is it, isn't it that the... Uh, um, the organizations are um, more, uh, where, where is the, the race about the profits and the, the too much of the focus is just on the profits? So how, how do you see it works? Yeah, I mean, Marta, there's still a process, and I will discuss uh, my time in Hungary in a few minutes. I mean, organizations cannot survive unless they bring value if they're profitable. So somehow maybe the media press or as developing countries go from one system to another, profits and corporations have become the dirty word. I mean, I view just the opposite. Well-run companies, high values, are a true gift to society. And you provide the right solutions, you bring the products, you provide dignity of work, you provide employment, so people do not have to leave the country or do not have to leave your company to go to another company. So I do think even that context of our organization is fully and only obsessed with profits. I do think quite often it's asked from a wrong perspective. And even at the same time, I mean, the business roundtable in the US have updated their charter to say that obviously investor and, and shareholders but tourists are important, but also the importance to all the stakeholders environment included. So I would really argue that successful companies, as this becomes a much more global world, that's becoming much more of a reality. And hopefully, if somebody would ask you that provocative question, Marta, I mean, hopefully, I mean, you or, or somebody would ask the same question for Nick, it's that you guys would have five, 10, 15 answers. Why, obviously, to be, um, to be a profitable company? Or for MK2025 to be sustainable, I mean, that should be a badge of honor but then you go back to your mission statement, what you deliver for your customers. And I do think that's sort of a change in the discussion for being defensive rather than being proactive. Why are you proud with your company? Why are you proud to all the things you do for your customers, for your employees and for the community? So, I mean, yeah. I, I do take an exception to that. And I do think there's more of that across. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. But the trend certainly is moving that way. Yeah, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it has to be, as I see it, uh, uh, for, for the future, you have to be a uh, bigger balance be, between profit, focus on the profits and the values. Do you think that maybe uh, when this balance is not, uh, when actually when this balance, uh, this balance shows, uh, this uh, results at some point with a, badly for the company. Do you agree with that conclusion? When there is no balance between profit focus and uh, values, that means investing in long-term values for, for one company. 
I mean, Marta, I do believe there's always exceptions, but I do believe to be sustainable for the long term, you need to be an attractive provider to your customers. You need to be an attractive place where employees want to work. So I do think mid and long term, with all communications and visibility, unless you behave this way, unless your company does, the long-term success will be, um, you know, will be, um, will be in doubt. But I do want to go back to the point, I mean, to use a sports analogy, there's an expectations to really deliver value. Just because you're in business, just because you're not for profit, I mean, it's not a God-given right for you to survive as an organization. So sometimes people maybe do not want to think that way. I mean, it's funny, in colleges, in high schools, people always get graded, including, um, including in the, uh, would you make the music team? So I do think that's sort of a, again, I, I did not go through the competing and winning element uh, of my top six. I told employees, look, we spend way too much time at the office not to be want to be the best. I'm going to give it my all. I expect you to give it your all. And if it's too hard for you, we'll miss you. You may want to go work for somebody else. Again, remember number two, I'll do everything possible to help you fulfill your ambitions. You can have my job or anybody else. But again, just you know, to guarantee employment and not to be caring for the, for the outcome of the results, it's equivalent to a, to a bad football team or bad basketball team. Just well, we'll come, we'll practice and whatever happens, happens. Versus you know, whether you play a triangle offense or defense or you play, there has to be a real mission and sometimes people would say this is, is hard, this is uh, too hard edged. I, mean, I would argue that's what people want to work for. If you have that kind of opportunity, they're still going to work for your company as opposed to leaving your company or leaving the country to go other places. You're able to balance customers, employees, shareholders in the community. And that is the opportunity, I think, for people calling you on this, um, um, on this uh, webinar. I know lots of the people from the Kellogg program. That's what you guys are telling me you want to do. And um, again, I for one look at leadership as a real privilege. I mean, some leaders have got to say, oh, my whole world's my shoulders. They have all these pressures and this and that. Versus leadership is a real privilege. I mean, you choose, <laughs> you choose your calendar. You choose uh, hoping to do the right things. Again, that's my hope that we really keep accelerating the development of leadership values in um, in Macedonia. Yeah, sure that uh, leadership is a, is a big privilege. Uh, yeah. Responsibility, of course, but the, the privilege is, is, is big. So what do you think, what will you say that the values that one leader will, is uh, of the future, fast changing society is needed to possess? I mean, all of us are so different, and that's what I really believe making public comments is so important. There really is somebody who would stand up and make a sort of a comment that would not be appealing to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the organization. So I do believe, um, and actually this is a perfect page. Um, I think I had used this um, in a uh, uh, in, in three hour class with Harry Kramer a couple of weeks ago. And if someone would ask me, what does it take to be a le leader? And they'll say, number one, you have to have a passion for leadership. That's number one. You pay a certain price for it, but there are also so many privileges. But as I've, I've been reflecting more on my career over the years, I do think it's very important to have a framework of how you make decisions, how you prioritize, and how you inspire your people. And that's why I have this framework. So again, I'll quickly go through mine. <laughs> it doesn't mean mine are the right ones, but it is important to ask yourself, what is your framework? Um, we don't have time to go through my personal mission. My professional mission is to help build impactful values-based organizations and leaders. So if it's a cocktail party, uh, if anybody else to say, look, I would love to have a legacy, to have a family business, that's, that's, that, that, that's a prototype for values-based organization, but also meant to hundreds of people. So that's a real passion for myself. Organizations, what kind of organization would you be part of? 
So you would ask me, again, it's become programmed. I only part of an organization, high values, high expectations, real commitment to people developing a meritocracy. And, and I would argue MK2025 is, is, that, is that type of an organization. So it can be a not-for-profit, can be a sports team, can be obviously a for-profit organization as well. Leadership style. I just went through the top six. And execution, do not have time to go through this, but it is important for the organization to know how you address opportunities and how you solve problems. If you wait for a problem to come, you have a statement to say, well, what process do we go to, to, to decide what we do? That's probably too late. And Nick had said, I mean, I can volunteer Dan Bragg or, or maybe my son Kirk to walk us through what we do with the ZF group. Well, we have two, Peter Drucker, probably the most famous management guru. You know, he has a process, he starts with, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And very important, what's right for the enterprise? and then goes through a process after it. I would love to have every CEO, every business leader, every country, prime minister or president to say what's right for the, what's needed for the country, not what's good for my political party. Same thing, what's right for the enterprise, not necessarily what's right for the next quarter. So there is a, so there's a continuous improvement and there's a Peter Drucker process. And if you have this framework, personal style type of an organization, what's your leadership style, uh, and how you solve problems, that's going to make it easier to make the right decisions at any time, and arguably even most so when you have crisis like what we have right now. <laughs> if you waited to do that, it's probably too late uh, on this one to do it well, but it's good to, because we will have crisis. I mean, there's a telecom bust in 2000, there's a great recession in 2009. You have the COVID crisis now. Uh, there's 9-11. Um, so there also will be crisis. But I would argue you need this sort of framework for how you lead at all times. That's going to be so helpful to you during times of crisis. So um, this was, uh, can we slowly close like the, the, the first uh, chapter, which was um, of our today's talks about leadership. Uh, can we conclude that it's very important everything to start from the self-reflection because uh, when first you need to do the same process of problem solving and uh, where do we want to go with, within ourselves as leaders and then to, to make these uh, processes within the organization and, and basically uh, make it uh, as a company culture. Absolutely. And it is very important as a, as a leader to keep reflecting on an ongoing basis. So absolutely. I do that daily, uh, monthly, and annually. But that, but that, that self-reflection, nothing is static. But that self-reflection is so important. And to get people around you, they'll tell you the truth, not only what you want to hear. So I would like to go back a little bit in your childhood, or okay. maybe not childhood. <laughs> and I found something very interesting. Uh, so I don't know, for me, this was uh, from the press. Uh, of course, this is something that uh, really describes you as, as a leader or as a future leader from uh, since your childhood. It says like this, goes like this. Shortly after he moved to the United States, Mike Zafirovsky was asked by a high school teacher to describe his home country of Macedonia. Nervous about his language limitations and realizing he was in the gym, he instead <laughs> asked for three weeks to prepare a report. The classroom response was overwhelming. It was the first time in my life that I received a standing ovation. He said years later, I worked it to my advantage. I really love this sentence. <laughs> so with this kind of determination, we can go with a lot of, uh, we can continue with a lot of press. I think that defines your life. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, to push yourself into a good role model has always been very, um, um, very useful. But yeah, thank you for that reminder. It was, um, <laughs> Challenging times. I hated leaving Skopje. I hated leaving uh, Macedonia. But um, 
but th there, there was a really, it was a, one of the defining moments. And helpful teachers, and again, in many ways, their teacher was a great mentor. They said, you can do that. She worked with me. I was both a he and a she, that's the, the principal and the, and, the, and the teachers. So that part of it to, to look how you were helped and then to look back to see what, how can you help others. So, but, yeah. But look, whether I'm so tough. Mm -hmm. A mentoring always. So this kind of determination sort of uh, and focus um, defined uh, your life, especially professional one. Through the years, Mr. Zofirovsky has developed a reputation as a corporate repairman. This is another of my favorite sentences written about you. Uh, another one says, he's a great guy to be in a folks hall with. He's one of those guys is pretty fearless. And one of my favorite press headlines, what I found about you was Mr. Fixit. <laughs> so it's a very good profile to talk about the, the crisis and the crisis leadership. So I, I think that maybe you can share some stories of, uh, about yeah, yeah. I, can go on, yeah. I can go on forever, actually thought of three or four of them. I'll just do one, if you will, and thank you for that. Um, and that this is somehow, again, when people are talking past each other, and I just came up with this example, and so, uh, when I went to uh, Hungary in 1996, I was running the G Light in Europe, and the business was acquired in 1990. Very famous communist era business. It's been losing money every year. Lots of frustrations within General Electric. So I came in April of 1996. And again, the, 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 even people thought it was a mistake acquiring that business. And uh, soon coming aboard, you can see the great level of animosity between the unions and the workers in General Electric. Their view is that GE had promised many things, and uh, so they even had a six-month uh, union negotiations on contracts. So it's a very adversarial situation. Um, and they would not allow me to speak with me. They, me, me, me would not allow me to speak with the unions. This says, no, they're going to use this to, uh, to uh, highlight, if you will, uh, to make it weaker, they'll never speak with the management team, they all want to speak with you. They thought it would be a negative, if you will, if I went, quote unquote, down to their level to negotiate as a CEO to the unions. I said, no, no, so this is a major crisis, and I want to speak with them. So again, go back to being fearless and to really being delivering your missions. And I said, you know, number one, I'm not sure if you realize what is the situation. This was supposed to be a major strategic acquisition for General Electric. We were losing $100 million a year. Quality is not where it needs to be. We have all these union rules and employees cannot do multiple jobs based on their needs. And we're not the enemy. I mean, we have 12 points of market share in Europe. Philips and Siemens are, are, are the dominant players. We have 18,000 employees with eight factories. And there's a good chance we're going to close this place unless we're on the same team. Now tell me three or four things that I can do for you to tell you that I mean what I tell you. And what I want to have is a three-year agreement. I cannot afford to negotiate for six months and all these signals, management is bad, wages are not very good. I want to have a three-year agreement on the flexibility in the rules. And I want to eliminate this nonsense of management is not employee friendly. And tell me what do we need, tell me the biggest mistake we've made. So they gave me all sort of, a, you guys are cutting nickel and dime years to death for using an American term. But also, so we are so proud to have a day of Olympics. Once a year, all the factories would come and they walk around the stadium, you know, Nishkanashwa, Vuka, Budapest plants. So they probably save about $50,000 for you guys eliminate that. I said, Mr. and I, I don't remember the person's last name, they said, look, consider it done. In three months, in September, we're going to restore the day of the Olympics. We should be competing on the soccer field. So we have management play soccer against the unions. And that's a good place to compete. But the workplace is now not to compete in the next three years. 
a market share went from 12 to 17 percent. Our losses went from almost 100 million to 80 million. Our exports to U.S. went from virtually zero, 30, 40 million to 200 million. But again, this is a crisis. You can hit us versus they, and I can walk you through things on, on, on Motorola. And this goes back to the current crisis. Yeah, but that's terrible, unprecedented. But unless you have some sort of a strong foundation, you address your employees, your customers with that level of resolve, then, 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 then obviously you're suboptimizing the opportunities. Some people would say, don't let any crisis go unanswered. And it's quite often easier to motivate people and for you to step up as a leader in times of crisis than when things are going well. Anyway, I said I have three or four, but I'll stop at that one because it's some, um, but uh, I just one example, again, hopefully all building on the framework of how you think about when a crisis will come. When crisis come, how do you react at, um, at, uh, at those periods? But is it possible how uh, always to work it to your advantage? Or it's sometimes it's enough that you know that you try your best? Uh, no, I mean, I, mean, it's, uh, I mean, if you're successful 60, 70 percent of the time, I mean, no, I mean, nothing in life, I mean, hopefully your values don't change. I mean, I'll give you the Nortel example. I mean, I believe in 2006, seven and first half of 2008 was the best job we ever did. New products, the leadership team, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction was all going through to the best in 10 years. We were not ready for the financial crisis in 2009. So get part of the leadership is, um, I mean, uh, I'll quote um, um, uh, Winston Churchill, uh, uh, greatness requires great level of responsibility. And so how you take it yourself, and even if things don't go well, you go back and explain to the people, this is what happened, this is what we did, and we learned something from it, and how do you move forward? No, but just to give you the impression, you asked me for any job I've had, I mean, I probably have at least 50 things that I thought were mistakes, <laughs> including being a chairman of MK2025, being a board member. Nikits would ask me, did you do everything right the last 12 months being a board member? I, mean, I can give you 25 or 50 items which were far from perfect. Hopefully five or 10 times as much on the positive side, but none of this. The life or business, there's no, and there's no such thing as perfection. So uh, do you think uh, like in the situations like this, like, like COVID when, uh, when in, a, in the long term, it's very, the world is changing? And this is, I think, the, for the first time in a way like this, the, to be changing uh, everywhere. Uh, so obviously, uh, it's necessary to to be fast in in uh, adaptation of the of, of the new normal, the popular world, or the, the new business tactics. So, do you think that uh, organizations who are prepared to do that will be more successful, or? Yeah. At, at, at this time, um, Marta, I would simplify in two approaches that management need to think, can your company survive? So number one is, are you taking the right actions to survive in the current environment? And if the answer is yes, can you use this current situation to your advantage? A number of companies will not survive, unfortunately, much of the 10 or 20%. So number one, your responsibility to your employees, to the investors is to do what's possible to survive. But also do, I do believe that the trends before the crisis will only accelerate. I mean, one of the biggest pluses has been technology. I mean, if you can just imagine how some of the biggest healthcare organizations, businesses, governments are working from home. I mean, fast or cheaper, lots of innovations they put in place. So technology innovation will allow organizations to truly, truly transform themselves. Um, I was listening to Jamie Dimon, the CEO of, um, um, the CEO of uh, JP Morgan a couple, a couple of weeks ago, but actually to encourage businesses to prepare for the worst, but to be ready for the best, but also to pro probe why so much was able to be done better, faster and cheaper now than it was done before. So again, that's sort of a question 
should be very much welcome um, within, um, I mean, within your companies as well. I mean, I can tell you, we only have 400 employees in our company. We spoke, actually, I looked at my notes, I spoke to them in late March, <laughs> within three weeks. And we are being, we are IT solutions company. We've been viewed as an essential business. <laughs> we've guaranteed employment for at least four months up front. So we're not sure what's going to happen. But we've got two companies where the previous leadership have a, have a long term commitment to the employees. So we made a commitment for four months. We also told them two things. You can expect we're going to tell you everything we know. We're going to communicate on an ongoing basis. And as soon as anything changes, we'll come back and tell you. So again, even in this COVID-19 crisis in a small business, we apply it to lots of the things that you expect the best, the best and the largest organizations in the world to do that. You are, you are um, reflecting and focusing um, on your messages um, in your speeches on innovation. Uh, growth is an imperative for healthy business. It's the equivalent to oxygen, water, and sunshine for plants and flowers. All industries must integrate new technologies and innovations. And uh, this was an occasion uh, giving a speech uh, on um, Media Innovation Forum 2019 uh, here in Macedonia and uh, uh -huh. a similar, similar view uh, as a comparison. It's uh, uh, 2007 in the occasion of adoption on the Cat Alliance Innovation National Platform uh, of Canada. The award of national prosperity will go to those countries that can generate international confidence in their ability to lead in the design, development, production, and distribution of, your, of the goods and services. These countries will attract and retain investment and talent. For nations to prosper, they must become leading innovation nations. We all need to do our part to get there. Etc. Etc. This was referring to Canada and USA. The first one uh, was for Macedonia. So um, we are in a um, in a crisis situation. I don't know how um, <coughs> how are you um, up to date with the situation on, on, uh, in in the country. Well, I would like to um, if you can. Um, reflect a little bit on what do you think Macedonia should, should do as a country, uh, what are the maybe opportunities, and uh, from the other hand, uh, since you already um, met some of Macedonian leaders through the years and, and talked to them, what do you think that um, are our priorities as leaders in Macedonia? I mean, Marta has said before, uh, is individuals and organizations, I mean, I, you either grow or you perish. So I do think even at this point of time, the commitment to leadership should be a top priority. Again, assuming you can survive, <laughs> assuming you can survive, it, 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 it obviously in the current environment, that's critical. And I would, um, 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 make the, the, the view that uh, uh, cuts should never take place in um, the leadership development programs and budgets, if you will. It is important to keep reinforcing the messages and actually to give opportunities to the highest potential people to take extra opportunities to demonstrate the leadership um, in, the, in the current environment. So I, I mean, just a couple of small examples, the IT solutions company, which I mentioned, we just kicked off a CL leadership program just, um, just two weeks ago. We think in this environment, as many people, companies are actually um, cost cutting, if they really are not thinking about the long term, we think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to gain market share. So in this period of time, we made a commitment not only to retain employees, but we just hired four individuals in a sales training program believing that technology and innovation will be very much impacted positively in the current environment. So again, just, you know, just, just one small example. And you had mentioned uh, leadership development uh, programs. I mean, I think there's one slide, maybe you can just show it really quickly on the steps to a leadership development program. I'm only gonna spend uh, less than a minute 
but every organization talks about leadership development programs. Very, very few people take it seriously. So I'm here highlighting five items. Again, this is a half an hour discussion with many examples. But if you can only take one thing in um, from this one is to make it top priority, invest the time. Good times, okay times, and bad times. And really, it's, uh, it's, in all cases, it's not a program, it's a way of life. And when I was uh, guest lecturing at this group a couple of weeks ago, I made the, uh, the comment on the Kellogg uh, and Nestle 325 program. If you go to the next page, uh, it's easy to talk about programs but how you actually implement them. And again, we're very proud of the MK2025 program. The goal actually is to accelerate development of the next 100 CEOs in the country. Not necessarily limited to that, but we've gone through an unbelievable progress in the Kellogg Park, three or four weeks in Chicago is just one element. There's also comprehensive other leadership opportunities, mentoring with MK2025 board members, mentoring, we asked uh, the individuals to come up with a major program from their company and ongoing support. So again, this is one part, if you will, that MK2025 is trying to develop and try to accelerate uh, leadership development. And again, this was just in November last year. We spent five hours. This is mostly people have gone through the program or planning. And again, for me, this is like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> this is turning the future leadership in the country and we asked them, what did you learn? What are problems with your companies? What else can we do with the questions? How do you become a better leader yourself? How can you help your company become a better company? In that process, how do you make Macedonia a stronger country? And we'd love to have you volunteer, whether that's for MK2025 or other activities. Again, just one example among many of what's possible if you put your mind to it. And the wonderful thing about Macedonia, there's so many great leaders in the country. And again, I love to see most of those leaders stay in the country as opposed to, as opposed to um, keep immigrating elsewhere. Can you just, uh, maybe from the experience uh, by now, can you, can you say maybe one um, leadership um, value or something that maybe you can say as a general um, um, Oh, oh, I mean, general, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, I can tell you, our, yeah, the Macedonian executives going to Kellogg are receiving unbelievable marks, very consistent to what I see in Macedonia. But the, their commitment and passion, their empathy, their resilience, and generally very, very high IQ. I mean, those are the things that are just off the charts in general. Places where still some of the training um, and coaching they have is that still empowerment and delegation doesn't come as natural. The servant leadership also doesn't come natural, maybe because some of the role modeling from the past. And the accountability and transparency, how much do you communicate to your employees? So they're not bad per se, but relative to the other means from all over the world, I think those are some of the areas that, the, that our managers have made a commitment to keep working on, but the foundation of commitment, passion, empathy, resilience, and high IQ are just a wonderful foundation to be building from. Okay, in the interest of the time, I, I, would, I, I would like to thank you for uh, you know, yeah. the uh, interesting conversation. We can continue a long time. I will. I will skip my my uh, plan for the closure on women leadership. <laughs> we will leave it for for a next a next occasion. Uh, Nikita is uh, within the questions in the chat, so I leave the floor with her and the questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Thank Marcos. You again. It's great to have you as one of the Kellogg um, uh, attendees. Well, thank you, Marta and Mike, but really there is queuing in terms of the questions here. So uh, I think everyone deserves to be heard. Uh, I will try actually to combine uh, the questions uh, which are already in the chat. And uh, I will combine them so far into three groups. The first one is directly going to questions related to leadership uh, and the role of the leaders today. Uh, the second group is uh, about the startup community in the country. 
uh, and what Macedonia 2025 can uh, do for them and what is the environment for, for startups. And the third part of the, uh, of the uh, questions is related more to the global economy or the new normal, uh, what we would say. So, uh, Mike, I will combine three questions on, on leadership. Um, and I think we will find a way how to combine them in the answers. Um, and Nick, it uh, may make sense to start with the last one because we really did not discuss much on COVID. So, so, so maybe you can ask me the questions on that one. Um, so the, the question, Mike, is essentially about the global economy. It's uh, posted from Zoran Jovanovsky, the advisor in the Economic Chamber of Commerce. And what he says is that, uh, what, is, what are your thoughts on the global economy and globalization? Um, precisely, he says, is globalization really dead, as many experts and politicians out there believe? And what, in your opinion, is the future of global business? Would we see more protectionism in the future, uh, countries and nations turning uh, inside to their economy and supporting their businesses? Or is there a bright future for the globalization? Yeah, thank you, Zoran. And as always, uh, great questions. Uh, I'll make a couple comments. Uh, the decline in GDP and employment is unprecedented. Only wars, or, uh, or, or economic or bank failures have caused this. So this is truly unprecedented times. And the economy will be down. Question like everybody is, what is that, um, uh, what's gonna be the form of the downside? People have talked about V's, W's, um, uh, L's, God forbid, goes down and stays down. I believe it's gonna be much more like the Nike swoosh it's going to it go down 10, 15, 20%. Now, I do believe the increases will be gradual, but I just say much faster than most people expect. So will not be bounced back. I do believe the US did many things wrong, but one thing which they did right is they put a full artillery of uh, government support, Federal Reserve um, providing additional funding, I think China and Germany did the same. I do believe that the European Union and Macedonia for that fact were slow in providing the stimulus. I do believe the stimulus is absolutely imperative to allow the, 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 growth, uh, the, growth, to, uh, the growth to return. In terms of a globalization, is it that? Absolutely not. I mean, we do go from times to times where people do try to uh, play the protection, uh, the protection game. I do think that uh, complete reliance, for example, for US on China for supply chain, probably was unwise anyway. So I'm not sure if that's, let's say globalization is going bad, but I do think people will be looking for a, what the risks facing our country, if you will, and how do we minimize those risks? But that thing is a globalization is a trend will, will continue, uh, there will be new opportunities, and I think for small countries, they're agile, and they, they have the, the education system and the communications. I do believe the, the opportunities uh, will be even greater now. I mean, people can see what's possible to do at home. Even for our business, again, this is not a promise, but as we hire future engineers or marketing people, not necessarily to I have a company in Macedonia uh, as a profit organization, as we hire people in the future, we will consider why not adding some people within Macedonia. So again, as you think about global, global community. But I do think that the downturn is real. I do believe the upturn will be much more positive and I was very happy to see the European Union announcing a $2.2 trillion stimulus this morning. I know Macedonia has done a few things belatedly, but I do think that support for the businesses is very important and even to, to eliminate some of the negative comments that are we helping businesses? I mean, we're helping businesses because they provide the employment, they provide the, 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 the tax revenues for the government. But thank you for that question, Zora. Um, thank you, Mike, as well for the answer. So I will go now with the say block of questions related to leadership. Uh, the first one comes from Stoicha Taskov. Thank you, Stoicha, for, for this question. It's more of a comment. Um, 
I unfortunately don't know you personally, so which I cannot uh, really say where you're coming from, but I hope we will meet in the future and thank you for being here on the uh, webinar. Uh, so uh, Mike uh, Stoice comments that um, leadership in ordinary times is everything that you actually said and explained. Uh, but in his opinion, leadership today is uh, more, uh, has a mission essentially to create rapid growth trajectory uh, for the future. And that is what every leader should do uh, at this uh, stage. Uh, the second one comes from Makedonka Dimitrova. Makedonka, thank you for joining this uh, webinar. You, I think, um, uh, joined all our webinars so far. Uh, so, um, Makedonka is uh, founder of the Institute for uh, Family Businesses here, but otherwise also professor at uh, University of American College, Skopje. She is uh, referencing uh, John Maxwell uh, in the book uh, called Developing the Leader Within You. Um, and uh, he says that the changes, uh, changes the situation that we are uh, currently in, creates uh, fear from failure. And the question is, do you believe that the biggest mistake that a leader could make is to fear failure before even starting the process? So in this sense, what would be your advice to, to young leaders? Um, although you talked about failure, uh, but uh, maybe we can add on the fear uh, from uh, failure. And Mike, if I can go to another comment, because it, it really um, also relates to, to leadership. And I think it uh, also goes more to the leadership in Macedonia. Uh, so it is, uh, sorry, coming from Viktor Kunovsky. So what Viktor mentions here is uh, that there is some international ranking on uh, values and uh, leaders. And he says that Macedonia is doing uh, very bad on this uh, ranking and that there are essentially problems with the environment or the environment for any leader is uh, very uh, challenging. Uh, so uh, out of 10 top values, uh, according to this uh, ranking, which was done in 2009 only, uh, Macedonia has uh, several limitations or leaders in Macedonia have several limitations. These are unemployment, uncertainty, poverty, corruption, bureaucracy, environmental pollution, crime, um, nepotism, and blame. And uh, he says, what values do we need to nurture in our leaders in Macedonia, uh, in organizations, and in the nation as a whole, in order to create impeccable results? Like working in this constrained environment, probably it is even more difficult for leaders in developing countries, I would say, not just in Macedonia, than the leaders in developing countries. Um, for this, <laughs> there's quite a few of them there. I'm not sure if fear of failure is the single most uh, fatal mistake, but, but certainly it's, you know, it's, it's um, among the top few. Uh, and that's why, I mean, when I speak, especially with venture capitalists, how do you create the climate that failure actually is a badge of honor? I think we've discussed it in some of the previous um, uh, previous seminars. Um, uh, in Silicon Valley, again, this is a how many times you failed. It's a um, it's a again it's a, what you have learned from that. Um, I would argue, and again, I, I realize this is a this is a pre-select group on this on this call to always start with yourself. Most of the entrepreneurs are by nature young, although you're seeing now many more people at the, even at my age becoming entrepreneurs for the, for the first time. Uh, it is a, um, um, I said, leadership does require passion and a commitment. And uh, again, part of the reason for the MK2025 obsession, if you will, with leadership, we would love to touch to elevate the discussion for 1,000 people by 2025 between the various programs. And I'm hoping through, not only through MK2025 to be driving it, but to, to be providing the forum and the platforms, and for each one of us to become, if you will, we are one of those people that can actually be the change we want other people to be making. And on the second question, can I be an outside way from you know, something that's 2009 survey, if that's what those results were. Some of the young people which we're interviewing for the programs, and I realized this is a self-selecting group, 
I'm very, very impressed with what we're seeing there. And Macedonia has a long way to go, and hopefully uh, you've listened to Nick itself, one of the enablers of ease of doing business, uh, the corruption index, the, the transparency index, uh, uh, also the quality of the environment. So we are very uh, bullish on increasing the discussion on the country with both the political leaders and with, with the government. But it is a, it's gonna require more involvement, including people on this phone call to be part of that change. I'm comfortable progress is being made, but we have a, we have a long way to go. And again, this is a, 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 a main reason, for, you know, a purpose for this one is to have you uh, reflect again, this is what, um, uh, when I was speaking with our 400 employees back a few months ago, I mean, this is the time with the extra time is to get really clear on your calling, uh, to block out time for things that really matter. Uh, and maybe again, this is a, um, I'm just pulling, I mean, if this can help this group, I think uh, answers the question rather directly. When I reflect on my career to date, I mean, the advice I give to everybody, is number one, that you own your career. The government, your uncle, even if he or she is a minister <laughs> or your neighbor, that you own your career, especially people on this call. Second advice is take the tough jobs. The toughest jobs never stop growing. Create your own development plan or re review with your friends, with your, with your peers, and seek out developing opportunities. If you're not comfortable, give speeches, force yourself to give speeches. If you're not comfortable in finance, take a finance class. Um, if you're not good in a, in a group setting, try to get a coach. Um, especially for the younger people, don't just work for an appraisal. I mean, some people are so obsessed with just the appraisal as opposed to keep developing your, your, um, your, your, um, um, your skill sets. Uh, get a mentor. And, uh, if, and, and also become one. It's amazing when people ask you questions, how you also, by answering the questions for your mentee, how you elevate your game. Have the results speak for themselves. And again, if you keep explaining, you didn't get results. And the reason, again, I'm not changing the discussion of the many challenges facing Macedonia. I mean, those things obviously are visible, they're easier, easier to discuss. But when you see the same Macedonians excelling in Sweden, in Germany, in the US, even the same attitude they bring to their discussions, I think there's a massive opportunity to do the same thing in the country. And again, that's why we're so thrilled to have Nikitsa uh, as the CEO for, um, I mean, for, um, for MK 2025. Again, again we, we actually were trying to, to elevate how we drive impact in the country, both directly and indirectly. So again, hopefully this is um, helpfully in, um, in answering, your, um, answering your question. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, so now I will switch to the group of questions related more to the startup community. Um, and I think I would be uh, essentially answering the first one. So posing it, but also answering. So this one comes from Jakob Moder. And um, he really welcomes your points and your um, discussion today. Uh, he asked whether we are considering as an organization to give back to the startup community in a form of establishing business angels group and or mentoring or advising for go to market of startups. Um, and he offers a, a part, kind of partnership with uh, Startup Macedonia. Uh, so I would uh, just say that essentially last year we started a pilot program, it's an upscale, and we selected uh, eight companies, startup companies from Macedonia. And uh, we provide mentorship to these companies. Uh, mentors are uh, so far our uh, members of the board of directors. Uh, but uh, in the selection process, we were supported by the Startup Macedonia and by the Fund for Technology and Innovation. Uh, certainly, we look forward to expand this program. This was, as I mentioned, just a pilot program, but uh, we hope we can support and help more um, startup companies. And for that, we are developing online platform which will connect uh, uh, companies from uh, Macedonia with our professionals from the diaspora. So the platform will be matches and it will allow more startups to 
uh, contact, to be mentored and to be supported uh, and introduced um, in the foreign markets. Um, the question next, which is related to startups, is essentially a question uh, uh, from Hilde. Uh, Hilde is a Belgian entrepreneur and she's active in Macedonia the last four years uh, in the startup community. Uh, so I will uh, just rephrase what she's saying. And that's that um, uh, the environment in the country uh, for the startup community is not that uh, so good. And also she, um, she also complains kind of about the political leaders and um, uh, their uh, uh, say, uh, focus on, on startup community. Uh, but also about the uh, mentality of the workers and the attitude uh, towards work. Um, so probably it's um, you know just just referring to the um, constraining environment rather than encouraging environment for the startups. Um, wait a minute, um, just a couple of comments again. I'm very much aware of the challenges and opportunities in the country. And again, whether we look at things half glass half full or half empty. I mean, I'll just make a couple of observations on, on the one you already answered. Uh, again, MK 2025 has five different, if you will, initiatives, anyway, from promoting economic development to uh, facilitating the discussion of dashboard. But the one that's personally closest to my heart is a leadership development. You know, this opportunity to do more, including the startup community. I mean, we, we are all ears. I'm hoping we're going to have the next summit as scheduled in October. Hopefully, we can travel by then. Um, but the view really was for the Zafirovsky program to be focusing on CEOs for larger companies using some of the best practices that I've had at General Electric. The Schulich program is meant to be for mid to high potential employees to, to provide some of the best practices. The bit of entrepreneurial program or for smaller companies, if you will, would love to do something with, with the venture community organizations. I mean, there's an opportunities. Um, again, it's a, and I'm, I've already have asked a couple of people from the University of Chicago. They're very, they've, they, they've raised all sort of um, funds, I think close to $3 billion in their venture startup programs within the University of Chicago. So that's what I'm really hoping that with Nick, it's a, uh, now we should be able to organize uh, even some additional activities at the summit to be propelling leadership development of small companies, bigger companies, startups, if you will. And so, that, so that's very close to our mission. And again, that'd be a pleasure. And by the way, any volunteers from this group, just, just, just raise your hand. On the second one, I mean, I do think this is a very few some governments in small countries have played a very active role in the venture startup communities, but quite often it is the entrepreneurs themselves drive, in driving it. So, so, so I would argue uh, governments staying away or not having too many regulations is probably the most important thing. And of course, uh, the government can provide some support. And that's all, that's all a plus. I would like to challenge um, you know, the, the view of the mindset of the people in Macedonia. I mean, I, and I've seen it first and I've seen many of those comments. You know, I'll even go back to the view of a, this old Russian proverb, you know, we pretend to work, you pretend to pay us. And maybe it's the same way, even the leadership style, you know. You pretend to inspire us, you pretend to make this say, empowering environment, but you really do not behave that way. So I do believe that's sort of a, uh, remnants, if you will, maybe a more top-down approach. People simply work for a paycheck in management. It really does not believe their employees have the brains or the skills to be able to deliver. And I do think that reality sometimes has to get has to and has to get the challenge again. If I, if I'm one of those people. Um, if, I, if I have a business in Macedonia, if my employees are not motivated, if they come in late, if, if they're not producing the type of environment, the first thing I would do as a leader, I'd go home and look in my mirror. It says, Mike, people normally like to do good. They like to be told they are smart. They like to be doing a good job. They like to get paid well. They, 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 
they feel to they they they, they, they want to accomplish good things. So look at Amir that says, Mike, are you doing everything possible to make sure that employees number one believe that you provide me a platform, the education, you have a mission and vision for your startup idea. If the answer is if the answer is yes, then you need to replace your whole team. You've done everything perfect. <laughs> And you have a bunch of people that should not have the privilege working for you. Conversely, if you say, well, I'm stressed, and I'm, I'm using this simply as an exaggeration, I'm stressed, I can't get money from the bank, um, and the customers are walking away from me, so I go to the office, I'm yelling and screaming a dictatorial, and I can see from a body language the employees don't like me, then all of a sudden to say, look, I need to step back to say, what is my role as a leader? So I do know I'm providing this very uh, example is on the two sides. And the reason I gave the hungry example is one of those. All the experts that came to Hungary to say, well, this old communist, they don't know what quality is. They don't know Six Sigma. The unions think this is a cold war, so they have to say management is terrible. And again, I mean, fortunately I was a CEO, so I had the privilege of being at the top of the house. And I said, look, we're going to close the goddamn place. This is what you didn't expect from me. It was 18,000 employees. Again, this is not look at me how well I did. But again, I, I've seen that same people that supposedly are not doing a great job. They come to Sweden. They come to the United States. They become the best workers. And part of, again, part of the challenge for this one to say, how can we mobilize to inspiring the value is based, and again, if, I mean, and I, 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 I'm not the one to say, let's keep every employee. You have employees to share your values, and they can deliver to it. So, I, and, so I'm not sure this is a tough love, but this is simply stating the obvious. The leadership has responsibilities, and it's a privilege. And, and if you have a good idea, you theoretically should have people, especially in this environment, people should be lined up in, in the outside door when they work for you because there's probably enough fewer people gainfully employed now than a couple of months ago. And by the way, this is the kind of a discussion, one on one on one on fives. I mean, I love to get engaged. I know there's a couple hundred people on this call, but this is how you go beyond the superficial. You go through the reality. This is how one asks their own personal leadership uh, journey. And again, I'm, I'm the eternal optimist and all it starts with leadership. And people follow good leaders. This could be a great conclusion, I think, to, to the webinar, but we have some more questions. And Mike, just to remind you that we are... By, by the way, those are, they're bringing the book, see? There must be the 200 books I ordered from Harry Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I read it. I, mean, I have all things to do on Saturday. Uh -huh. And I started reading that book. I couldn't put it down. Yeah. You may try to... You may try to bring some for the summit, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, Mike, we are deep in the additional 15 minutes, which we said yep. we can also extend. But um, and I think your answer also captures a um, few of the other questions. Uh, so let me go specifically to to one question, and um, it's from Marta Tomovska, also Kelok alumni. So, hi, Marta, and thank you for these questions. Uh, so the question uh, is: uh, Can we, the leaders? create a new normal that is going to be better than the uh, old normal. What was wrong about the old normal? Uh, was that uh, the values or trust or greediness? And how can we become uh, better people? So I, I, I would just rephrase, like, can we build a better uh, new normal? Can the leaders build a better new normal? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, positively. Oh, I think I moved my, my screen there. Um, but uh, number one, hopefully, some of this has been done already. I mean, as we've been locked up, uh, the time for personal reflection, but if not, it's not too late to reprioritize your, uh, your life, your um, um, career ambitions, and how you're driving. So this is absolutely the best time, all my mentees, all the discussions that we have gone happen on, on this process. I do believe the new normal uh, is going to involve significantly less traveling. I think technology is going to become much more of a 
much more of a um, 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 uh, everyday occurrence um, for many of us. And many of the trends that are there even before the new normal would accelerate, like including the supply chains and how we, how we bring ideas to, uh, to the forefront. And I do think for smaller countries like Macedonia, this actually provides an opportunity. Uh, in theory, we should be much more nimble and agile to be able to implement to, to, to be able to implement those um, those new practices. The borders. There was discussion on protectionism. I would argue for countries like Macedonia and our ability to project for Macedonia on a global basis will be greater now than they were before, um, they were before the epidemic. Thank you, Mike. I'm tr scrolling through the chat and trying yeah. to find questions, but uh, maybe uh, these questions are just saying that we should have webinar two with Mike uh, Zafirovsky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, I would uh, like to combine two, two questions, uh, which in my opinion are, are related. Uh, the first one comes from Bolce Andrevsky. Thank you, Bolce, for being uh, here. Bolce delivered the previous uh, webinar. Uh, he's at Queen's University in uh, yeah. Canada. Um, so, Bolce uh, says, uh, what if your values are different from the values which are adopted or which are normal in the society and in the company that you work for? Uh, so, um, does it mean that you're constrained, like should you follow your own rules or um, try to adapt to the uh, situation? And the second one is, um, so, but I, here I, I, I relate this question to, to Macedonia and to, to the constraints that uh, leaders have in Macedonia in terms of the culture, the values, the, the norms and so on. And the second question is from Alexandra Milosevska. Alexandra sits on our Ambassador's Club uh, from recently. Uh, she's in the States essentially. And uh, she, she really says, what can we do in Macedonia in order to encourage more decision makers to have compassionate and empathetic interactions with their teams and to think more uh, as a value-based uh, leaders? I mean, I, I love those um, um, questions. Uh, on the first one, I've, I've been saying the same leadership objectives now for, <laughs> for 30 plus years. What hasn't changed is, are the motives and the beliefs and, and the trusting people that they want to do the right thing. So the view of a organization that is there for the customers, that really cares about their employees. People understand the financial results are important and to giving back to the communities. I mean, I do believe though, at least for me, those things are timeless. And then also reinforcing the view of a, we work way too hard just to simply going through the motions. They have high expectations myself and from you. They just work for me well. So if, if, you know, if I move in Macedonia or Estonia or New Zealand tomorrow, I don't think I will change. And I've been in 100 plus countries, have not met anyone in the Middle East, Africa. I've not seen any individual that did not find that sort of environment constructive and positive. And I see that for Macedonians going outside the country actually doing the same. So that's why I do not see any limitations. I'm always looking um, for, for good ideas. I mean, I, I listen to your presentations and how you think about competition. So the frameworks do not change, the customers, the employees, but how to accomplish it, what different tools to use, new tricks, new technology to be able to allow the, for those things to come real, that doesn't change. And I do believe even Nortel, they did not finish the way you're hoping to, uh, that there is a great level of a camaraderie and trust and confidence with the people that we were trying to resurrect Nortel. So from that perspective is that the framework should not change, but just the openness to get ideas going from your employees. Um, it's, uh, it's massive. And the, and the second one goes back to the very first uh, opening statement from Marta. Be the change. You know, even if you have only one person working for you, what do you think that person is saying about you? 
if it's not amazing, what can you do to help yourself? Again, there's enough high level people that really want to do this. I'm just saying, give it a chance. You have nothing to lose. Thank you, Mike. And I really uh, feel uh, sorry that we cannot answer all questions, but I would really like to thank uh, all of them. So I will read some names. Uh, the question which I asked was essentially from uh, Alexandra Burgovska, not from Milosevska. Uh, no. There are questions from Naum Barzov, also Kellogg alumni, Daphina Bekiri, Borian Trajkovski, um, Mitko Mirevski, um, and, and many others. And um, really, I think uh, they would, uh, yeah, they, they deserve some answers and uh, let us think whether yeah. we should um, yeah. go on with uh, another uh, webinar, yeah. Mike, uh, or maybe organize a session when you come to, to Skopje for the, for the summit. All I want to say is that it's a pleasure. It's always a real privilege to be speaking with Macedonian executive, Macedonian uh, uh, citizens, I'm so happy to be back to be a Macedonian citizen personally. Um, as I said, th those are challenging times, uh, but also the commitment to leadership in doing the, um, in doing, taking this time to reflect. Uh, it's the right thing to do. You being on this uh, uh, webinar, it's an in indication of your commitment to better yourself, to better your company. And I say it's always a Pleasure, can't wait to have to see all of you again. And Nick, it's I'm always a phone call away for any follow-up sessions. Oh, that's perfect, Mike. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank uh, Mike and, and Marta specifically for organizing the interview in this webinar and uh, also to everyone that is on the call. And uh, I believe as uh, Mike mentioned that there is already some bias or that you're self-selected to, to be on this call, meaning that you're either great leaders or to become great uh, leaders. Uh, I would like to end this session on, um, probably we all have different takeaways from this uh, session, uh, but I would uh, mention, I have a privilege to mention my two uh, main takeaways from the session, something that I would consider and think of um, uh, more deeper and in the future. And these are that, uh, first one is that you choose your calendar. This is for me very, very important takeaway and set your own priorities. Don't complain on the others and the environment. And the second one is, uh, what is your framework? Uh, and I think uh, when I get back uh, home or next week working week and so on, I would really want to, to think and to put this into writing, what is my personal framework? And I think we should all, all do that. That's the, the best way to become better leaders, uh, both in the companies, in private life, but also in the society. and. Um, in the overall environment in the country. So again, thank you everyone and uh, there will be a follow-up session apparently. <laughs> <laughs>